Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Knox Makers. It's Tuesday, and I'm Isaac, and I'm excited to be here with you all. Uh, as is our tradition, we have gathered tonight for Show and Share, where we encourage our members and folks from the community to bring in projects that they've been working on. Successful, unsuccessful, still in progress, whatever it is, we're excited to see what you've been up to, to learn and be inspired by your work. And we've got several interesting looking shows this evening. Uh, first of all, we've got Colin, who's going to show off his smithing magician. Kind of cheated. Um, I've recorded some of the process of this on video, and uh, I kind of edited it together. So, anyway, this is what the finished article looks like, which may not mean much to many people. There's a bottom die that goes in there, and a top die that goes in there. And the rest of it. So today's new project, a homemade smithing magician. I don't know if you can hear this at all. Bottom dies so that you still have two hands free for holding your workpiece and a hammer. To start with, we're just going to cut four pieces of this angle iron and then we'll put a space room between them, weld them together, and that will form the vertical part of the tool. Okay, so we have our four pieces. We just need the filler piece to go in between them and to weld them together. So that's the vertical frames welded up. You see the uh, spacer in the middle there. That gives us a, a nominal thickness in that area of half an inch, which is what we're going to use for the die. You see the tops are ground off slightly, just to flatten them up. Uh, we're going to take those down to the machine shop and mill that top end flat and mill the end square to it so that it all sits straight. This piece will form the base plate. Uh, the verticals will sit here and here. Forging will take place in the middle. And the offcut I will use to make the uh, top and bottom dies. I'll then weld uh, grade 8 bolts to them to reinforce the ends of them. So, thanks to Billy's expert help in the machine shop, we have milled the sides and the central die and milled the ends and got it all welded up square and straight so that uh, we can now start assembling the uh, straps that will hold the dies in place. And here is the machine top die that will slide down between the two verticals like so. And now we kind of jump ahead. You can see the uh, brackets uh, welded in place to support the dies. Uh, bottom die which will is a half inch thick block and we'll weld a 3 8 bolt across there use a grade 8 bolt so it's heat treatable and will harden up and will withstand the wear and tear of being pounded on and that'll just drop straight in obviously with the bolt on it'll sit a little higher and then we take the top die and we weld a 3 8 bolt to the top and the bottom so that the striking surface and the forging surface are both hardened and will withstand the wear and tear. And you drop your piece of stock in there, heat that up, take your hammer, obviously not a little toffee hammer like this, but uh, that's pretty much it. So we'll just have to do the welding and heat treating. So, so here we are with the grade eight bolt welded to the top of the bottom die, that drops in, the top die, again bolts welded top and bottom so that the striking surface and the forging surface are both going to be hardened and will withstand the wear and tear, and then again bar stop, you'll notice that the the gap sits a little higher thanks to the 3 8 bolt that's in there now. And we'll use a proper hammer. Proper hammer? <laughs> OK, 
Okay, so here it is installed in the forge. We've cut the bolt down on the bottom, so we can attach it to the anvil. This is Andrew. Say hi, Andrew. Hello. And in there, while the die's getting heated up, ready for heat treatment. First time trying it. So, what you base the, the issue you always run into with blacksmithing is that you've got to have a bottom tool and a top tool and a hammer and the work piece. You run out of things to hold them. You hammer it. So, this is intended to uh, hold the top die of whatever shape you make it uh, so that you can do it on your own. Normally, you have the one die in the hardy hole of the anvil, you hold your workpiece, you hold the top die, and you get somebody else to hit it for you. Uh, only works for small jobs. Obviously, if you're trying to do uh, an eight pound lump of steel, it's not gonna fit in. But uh, um, you can buy one commercially. Uh, they're quite expensive. Um, I figured it was not for makers, not Knox buyers, so <laughs> I went ahead and made one. That looks like that's going to be really handy, and I definitely appreciate you having shown us the process. We don't see as much uh, shares from the blacksmithing area as uh, I would enjoy, so thank you for that. Uh, next up, we've got John, who has brought a relay control board to share with us. Hey, I'm, I'm John. Uh, so I'm not super prepared for tonight, but I've kind of was been meaning to show this for a long time, so I said screw it. Uh, how do I activate the cam? Oh, never mind. So this thing that I've been working on for a while is called Automato. Uh, Kind of like um, it's a DIY device for agriculture because all my plants die because uh, uh, I'll never water them, uh, you know that sort of thing. So it's kind of geared for like, and I also grew some mushrooms with this thing, the edible kind, not the psychedelic kind. Um, but it's like really good for people who are having a hard time like maintaining things that are supposed to live that you later consume or do whatever you want with. Um, and uh, yeah, I just started out with SparkFun uh, components and kind of built a prototype and then uh, had some help with some engineers to kind of get me some, you know, parts where I'm not really so great at, like I can do basic circuit design and, and very simple programs, but to make sure something that's gonna hook up to mains power is safe is like 
pretty far from what I can do. So uh, I hired someone else to do that. And this is our first like kind of decent looking prototype. Uh, it's got a really shitty enclosure because uh, I sent the good one off to a friend to beta test. But I, I'm really proud of the um, silk screen. Uh, so anyways, like the, and then there's also this other control board, which is like a, kind of like a fancy um, Arduino. It's got an ESP32. It's, uh, it's got LoRa on there. So we've got some mesh networking that we're developing so that you can wirelessly communicate between boards and such. And so this is kind of the, one, the board that takes all sensor data in. Um, so like, you know, if you got like soil moisture sensors in your garden for uh, when you want to irrigate, or like you're in a greenhouse and you want to control like the temperature and the humidity, you know, you can, you have this kind of board and you hook it up to one of these. It's, you know, not quite fully developed, but this is, you know, just like functional prototypes right here. Um, also kind of proud, like went fancy with the uh, silk screens. So I'm going to plug it in and just to show like a simple example. Um, so I've got four, four relays on here and Unfortunately, this LED light bulb is going to turn on, so it might blind the camera. So I've just hooked it up to this little temperature probe. Um, I'm going to use this to convert an old chest freezer into a, a low-power terrarium um, for, growing, uh, for growing mushrooms. Anyways, so this is just... Um, temperature controller, it's set to a certain range and uh, I'm going to hold it to warm it up and after, you know, like 10 seconds it'll get up to a certain temperature and then the relay will turn off. Um, so in the, on the, the board that's kind of off the screen, that has just all the smarts on it. So you program the ESP32 with your temperature range. Uh, so I really hope it works because it worked right before I got up here. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, whatever. There it goes. Yay! <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so now I let go and it eventually heat back up. Um, I guess I can pass this one around if folks are interested. It's, um... So this one's got the screen on it. It's still working on form factor and stuff like that, but I bought the, uh, or I, I trademarked the name Automato and, like, I'm official LLC. So I've been doing a lot of work trying to get going. Yeah. How difficult was it doing the LLC? I was a real pain in the ass, uh, but I wound up just going through UT. Uh, they have a legal services uh, kind of thing for like that their um, PhD students offer. So it's basically free legal uh, re legal work you know, for people who don't have like a whole lot of money to pay for, uh, you know, professional. And it's a simple enough procedure and they, it's guided by a uh, professor. So like, I'm sure they could have given me better advice, but I mean, I just needed to get something started. So, yeah. Let's Hey, that is a snazzy silk screen. Uh, shout out to UT, by the way. Uh, they also did uh, our trademark work for Knox Makers. So if you have legal needs along those lines, uh, we can definitely recommend them. They looked after us. Next up, we've got uh, Ball and Cage with the heater. You might be asking to yourself, what is a ball and cage? Am I right? So what is a ball and cage? A ball and cage is a whittled item. I found it in a book. So essentially, no matter how many times you move it or shake it, it won't come out, but it will get stuck because I made it like a nut. Not the kind of eat, no, you do eat this one. 
It looks like a walnut, but you're not here to finding out how I made a walnut inside a cage. You're finding out how I made a ball in a cage. Now, let me just ask this one question. How many of you actually know how to make one of these? All right then, one with the purple mask. How do you know how to make a ball in a cage? Oh, how to? I thought you said you might want to know how to. <laughs> well, now you question will be answered. Essentially, it's as easy as not putting it in. You simply make it in. Because as you know, make. This process is long and tedious, but very rewarding. If you like seeing this little item, this little trinket. But if you make it better than me, it will be a ball, not and what's a 3D oval? It, does anyone know what a 3D oval is? Okay, so you will not make an egg. You will make a ball. And this little bit down here doesn't mean anything. This failed prototype, but I made it to a stand. So when you make a ball in cage, here's one thing you need to remember. Never under any circumstance take your knife and try to force it in one direction. Never force it. You have to glide it easily. If it forces, you will do what I did and split the ends. This is why this is a failed prototype. And this is not because it does not have any split ends. But essentially, this is a trinket. What I, have I will answer your question if it's in with my bounds of knowledge. How long did it take you and what kind of it? Father, answer my question. <laughs> Basswood. Well, it took me a total of maybe five hours. Okay, I'm just saying, I was like, did you black out through the process? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure. I'm still 14, I have to, I have to do school. Tell about wiggling in the back of the taxi my friend's car. Oh yeah, I got her car all dusty. Because <laughs> I was going at this thing with a file for the better part of 30 minutes. Trying to make this more like a ball. But it turns out I just made the place really woody. But it's a very simple process, and who wants to know how to make it? All right, I see several hands of the crowd. Anyone else want to know how to make it? All right, then, we have two more people. Father, this does not include you. We already know you how to make it. Essentially what I did, I took a gou gouging chisel on all these areas right here. And then I hauled them in about maybe one centimeter. And then I started working towards all the corners, making holes to each one. And then through there, I was able to put my file through and then open it up a bit. I did this with all uh, eight corners, four corners, eight holes, gouges. And then I was able to flatten it out with a file and go at it like this, instead of using an angle. But you can see where I made a few mistakes with this little lip right here. More noticeably right there. So essentially, don't do my mistakes, don't make it an egg. And once you have all these gouges filled out, you can start going at it. The strategy I used was keep these two little areas up here 
full and then you can work your way into a ball. But I cut it off prematurely, ended up with a walnut in a cage. So now when I shake it around real bit, do it, it will get stuck because it's oblong. So this little tincture project is very easy to make, rather fun to make, and if you want to kill time, this is the best way to do it. This is, had been ball in a cage by the heater. Man, that is some fancy whittling. I'm all proud when I 3D print something like that. Uh, next up, we've got Mark, who has brought a 3D print template to metal to show us this evening. Mark? Find out. Oh, yeah. I don't know how I can compete with that kind of showmanship. <laughs> you never best me. I, I, I will try my best. I'll throw some cute little trinkets on here to stare at while I'm trying to get everything working. How's that? All right. Now that I'm making a mess here. All right, let's see. Should remember where this plugs in. Okay, is there an HDMI cable up here? Ah, oh, I found it. I was. Hmm. All right. Hopefully. May. There we go. Ah, it's coming up. So I'm just trying to get the computer ready, but I suppose I better make sure it's working properly. So you said there's a button up here I need to set? Yeah, so here on input three. So we want output all, we want input three. I need to learn how to do this so I don't have this issue in the future. All right, let's see. So I was going to. Now if I can just see, I had my reading glasses with me. Oh, man, that's bad. All right, somebody tell me when I get near the start. <laughs> Set up slideshow, rehearse. Okay, here we go, from beginning, that works, I think. Yeah, great, all right. So um, what you're looking at is uh, a rough 3D model of a um, analog V3 seat mover that's on my, uh, my sim rig. And the reason for all of this is to provide isolation. There's uh, some springs all around it, and there's a transducer in front, and there's a great big butt kicker that hooks in the back, which we'll get to in a minute. And the, the whole, uh, the, the tough part was trying to get the minimal height because this thing is about two and a half inches thick. And uh, let's see, I was gonna, well, I don't even know if the, if the other side of it really even matters, but so the whole point was, was to create everything in 3D materials that I could actually test fit. And there's a lot, well, and now I'm putting things under here that you can't see, doing this wrong. Um, so I wanted to make sure all of the uh, fasteners work and I could actually get everything uh, to fit on the, the actual and I just went past it. So there were bolt holes that had to align, um, and then there were physical dimensions I had to meet, and I went through numerous iterations with the 3D um, printing in order to get everything to fit correctly. There were, uh, on the inside here, there's a Zaxby sandwich. So I was going for just easy to find, so this is this quarter inch angle, and that was like this one inch by one and a half quarter inch bar, I guess. It just happened to be enough to fill the gap so that I could get a compression fit on it and bolt through. So everything was to get something solid that would actually support me on top of my racing seat and not uh, make a mess. Then 
I had to figure out how to, uh, the top side of the equation is the seat. So it had to fit on top of the isolation. And so I prototyped the, uh, what the plates would be like using this and made sure everything would line up and um, actually test fit everything together. So you can actually see, I, you know, I cheated a little with the clamps, but had the seven and a half pound butt kicker hanging off the back and the ESP 429 hanging on the front there. And uh, I was able to get the actual spacing, the seat brackets actually clamped in a little at the back so it wasn't quite even. Um, so then I, uh, here, here's the raw materials I started with. And, uh, and I went about taking care of this in the only way I, I had at the time. Now, this Saturday, Billy's going to fix the situation and teach me how to use the bridge port. But I took care of that like you would if you were um, trying to hog out some wood without a dado blade and making multiple passes over my table saw to get that and then filing it. So I really, not the best way to get it done. And then I uh, basically made outlines of everything else and cut it out with my bandsaw. And uh, I got the parts made, despite the crude implements of destruction I was working with. You can see this little, it's not real clear in here, but there's little edges where you can see where the blade went by in some of those slots. Um, so this is the actual, all the aluminum parts all bolted together from the underside. So you can see there, everything, it's very solid. Um, and then, uh, based on the measurements I had, I took the uh, 3D printed parts and used them to create the outlines for the aluminum. And then uh, this is what I have to work with at home. That's a 10 inch drill press. It's not much. Um, and it's an aluminum cutting blade. It works. And you can see I've got all the beveled holes and so forth. And. Uh, these are what the plates came out like. Um, I didn't take a lot of time to pretty them up because they're on the underside of the seat and you don't see them. And then um, everything mounted up. Eventually I ended up, there's two sets of holes here. I had to use a uh, smaller profile, a little shallower, just so I could fit my quick release for the uh, flight stick. So, um, and then here are the full plates underneath the seat. These had to be very low profile boats, be, uh, bolts because there's not much room and there had to be some room to for the springs to flex. And this is a mess I made because I tried to get a five point belt installed and that's a rather painful situation if you don't do it right. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with, I've gone to a six point belt now, much more comfortable. It comes out across your legs, much nicer. Um, so this is initially how I came up how it came out, and you can see the real low profile bolt. There's not much space between here, um, but there's enough, and it doesn't bottom out. Um, one of the, uh, the things I kind of glossed over was that the, uh, now let me try to see if I can do this here, is that the, because it's a seat mover, I had to get all the clearances set up in here and I had to um, ah, hang on one sec there we go and so I was actually moving this around in uh, to make sure that I, I wouldn't I wouldn't actually overlap anything and had to make sure I had all the motion in place and not uh, not cause any problems. So I spent spent some time with that and adjusting pieces and I went through three and four and five iterations on some of these parts before I finally got everything together. And there's a cutout on you. Did I do something to make that happen? Yeah. Okay. I think the second spring is on the first spring. Oh, did I need to drag it over? At least it's an extended deck box Oh, I guess I hmm, all right. Great. Oh, look at this. Oh, what in the heck are we dealing with now? All right, let me see. I don't want to prolong this. Display settings. I don't know how much. Okay, I see. Wow. Um, 
not sure how to handle that. I thought before, I only want to make it a single monitor, right? Or I just said duplicate on the other. Mirror. Mirror, yeah, it didn't get me that. Set up dual monitor. All right, I don't think I'm going to bore you with this. I can't find it. But the uh, what I was basically doing was um, showing the entire model that you saw earlier, and I was rotating it around where you could see that the parts were, these were basically barely fitting over the seat mover underneath, and just there's a lot of very tight clearances. Um, I don't know how much more I can cover without having everything up, so I'm going to um, call it and stop there. Um, if anyone's interested, I've got a pile of 3D printed stuff over there. Some of it's rather large structural stuff with bolts and various things I've played with if, if anyone cares. Um, yes, sir. Okay. The, I have a sim rig. So for, for grown-ups who want to pretend they're car racing, <laughs> all right, you have, you have this thing inside your house. And you put VR goggles on and look silly to anyone around you because you're very intently driving around the racetrack and to the rest of the world, you're sitting there. <laughs> the, uh, the seat mover will move the seat and the tactile will let you feel the road. So, and so the combination is I'm driving around a corner and I hit a rumble strip. The tactile goes and I feel that I'm going over the rumble strip. And if it's a curb, the motion will kick me sideways and I'll feel that. As I go into a corner, it'll arc a little. And then there's seat belts that tighten, so when I hit the brakes, it'll pull back and I'll feel like it's braking. And, and it goes on. It's I, I won't go into everything else about it, but the bottom line is that the, the, the motion system I have is small and compact, and my rig has to fit into the corner of my media room when I'm not using it, so I can't go for anything more elaborate. They've got big, full chassis movers and so forth. But what I went with was the seat mover, and uh, and this was just challenging in order to get it to fit into the format that I needed. It had to be small and compact, and adding height to a seat mover causes issue. You really want it to be compressed where your center of gravity is low so that it can react quickly and you don't stress the motors out. And did that, yeah? You answered my first question about the seat belts. I was wondering if they were actually for show and for go, and it sounds like they're for go, which is cool. Yes, the reason for the six point seat belts is because they pull tightly. They simulate up to two G force. I've got two actuators behind my shoulders. And so when I hit the brakes and I go around the corner, it pulls harder on the outside shoulder than the inside shoulder. And, it, and they also work when you're, when you're downshifting, so you paddle shift or whatever, and you're, you're braking, it'll actually simulate that you've downshifted and you actually feel the jerk as you down, and you also get a clump in your seat from the tactile when you touch it. So it all fits together. Yes? Two things. What uh, software CAD program were you using? And can you comment <laughs> on that? Okay, yeah, so, design cycle. perfect, yeah, the, um, the next verbal race, racing supplies drawings of this. The drawings and their dimensions were not accurate. Okay. I ended up having to go back with a caliper and measure it. I'm off camera. <laughs> See, I had to measure everything. Uh, by hand. And there were also little things I had to take into account, like uh, the radius corners inside where they, they bent the metal and, and, and little things like that. And then I, I changed the bolt layout and then I came up with improvements and gold plated and engineered it. Yes. This is from my personal rig, but I'm not the only one who's using it. I did share my STL files with the gentleman in Germany who has printed them out and he's in the process of fabricating them for himself. I did design some other things that are in production 
and a company that makes forty, fifty thousand dollar sim racing rigs over there called SimTag is selling these parts to do-it-yourself people for the cheap seats. So they sell the full-blown big rigs and they sell these parts and it's through another company that I've been trying to help out. I haven't made a dime, by the way. I'm just trying to help the, the guy who's designing the stuff out. So, um, but I designed a seat plate that can hold up to six transducers under the seat and uh, brackets that could be adjusted. Um, and uh, there were some other things, but yeah, but this is just something I designed for myself because why not? Okay. Are we any more? We good? All right. That is really remarkable and intricate work. Okay, thank you very much. It's really cool that your design is international. That must feel really neat. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Adam, who has brought the pen of despair, which sounds fairly ominous. Okay, so uh, some of you probably were here oh, a month, month and a half ago. I showed off a couple pens I made. Um, so. Pens have kind of become my thing lately, and um, I had a coworker that all of us really liked who retired recently, and I decided I was going to make a pen for him for his uh, retirement. So it couldn't be just you know an average you know slap some wood on the lathe and hog something out in three hours thing. I wanted to actually put some design and some time into it, and I bit off way more than I could chew. <laughs> um, so the pen final pen I came up with. Um, I wanted to try several different techniques, some interesting woods, new method of sealing it, stuff like that. So I tried all of these new methods on it and ended up with a monstrosity of a pen that took me about 30 hours to make. Um, so this is the final pen. Um, so this is cedar um, and uh, see cedar, African ebony and hard maple. Uh, the ebony is the black scallops on the end, and then the hard maple is in the, uh, the um, Celtic knot. Uh, the metal accents are brass in six thousandths of an inch and ten thousandths of an inch. There's six thousandths for the angled elements, and then uh, ten thousandths for the uh, edge-on elements here. Um, it is a fountain pen right here. Um, yeah, so... Um, I kind of snuck and asked him what his favorite wood was uh, before he retired, and he meant, said cedar. So that's why I chose cedar as the wood. And I'd never made a pen out of cedar before, and I'm actually shocked at how good it came out. Um, the pen kit is the uh, cogent cobalt gold and gunmetal from Woodcraft, um, and I dented it one time already right here. Tiny little dent that I covered with permanent marker, so I hope he doesn't notice that. Um, but yeah, uh, so the reason it took me so long is I went through four generations on this pen. Uh, funny story, uh, brass doesn't like super glue. Um, well, maybe it likes it just fine, but it won't stay with it. So when you glue it together, you put it on the lathe, you touch it with the, uh, the turning tool, and everything explodes in your face, and pieces shoot everywhere, and it's uh, terrifying. Um, but at any rate, I finally got the thing put together um, after all in all probably about 30 hours. I had a design for a box I was gonna make too, um, but I'm already at a month working on this and he, he retired at the end of December. So I'm like, oh, I, I bought a box online, said screw it. Um, but yeah, so this is the culmination of a whole crap ton of work. Um, I'll pass it around, people can look at it. Please, I, please don't drop it, you will see me cry. <laughs> Has he seen it yet? No. No, I'm gonna put it. I'm gonna put it in a box and ship it off to him this week. His, uh, I work. His brother still works with us, so his brother sees it. He says he's gonna love it. I just wish you could get like a, a face shot of him, like discovering the mm -hmm. Yeah, we want to really filming video. <laughs> yeah, give it to us. Uh, yeah, thank you. I couldn't think of. <laughs> 
Oh, oh, I could do that. I'm yeah. Saying, that's good gratification for you, too. <laughs> you see, it's joy. So anyway, here, I'll pass this around. That is really beautiful work. I can only imagine how loved your coworker is going to feel. Uh, next up, we've got Bob, who has got a recycled storage bin to share with us this evening. This is really, go away. Okay. Uh, what does a maker do when they're faced with a huge pile of potential? Okay, you start making things, right? Well, so I started and I made a workbench, okay? Because, well, I had the saw, I guess I didn't really, I have a, a crafts, um, DeWalt uh, uh, job site saw, and I took it off the stand and I put it into a corner of the workbench here. Um, there's a gal on um, YouTube. Does that work better? 180. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Keep it a bit upside down, so there we go. Um, I can't think of her name. It does fantastic woodworking on uh, on YouTube, and uh, I I saw her workbench with the saw integrated, and I thought, you know, that's perfect. I I really need more more surface, so that's what I did with that, and then having done that. Uh, I came in here last week and I found out we have to have storage bins. So using a little bit more wood, I went back to my source, right? And I got some flat boards and I planed them down and jointed them and, and everything. And I came up with my storage bin. Wow. And I'm not gonna pass this around. <laughs> oh, you're welcome to come up and take a look at it. And it is <laughs> it is properly labeled. So, thank you very much. Very nice, very nice. Uh, and bringing up the rear this evening, we have Brian, who has a table to show us. So I've been making a bunch of tables recently. Seems to be the trend. I don't normally make uh, drawings to work from, uh, but this one I did. So it's got all of the details that you would look for in a <laughs> strong CAD drawing. Conceptually, I wanted a dinner table uh, that was small enough for two people, so something like this, that you could also flip the top open, slide it to the center on some sliding dovetails and have something big enough for six people. This is for some friends of mine who just bought a new house and it's smaller than their old place and it was uh, fitting for their space. Don't let fortune drop it again. Yeah, right? My wife has a history of destroying things. Um, so, I can turn this light off, right? Is it this one? Nope, not that, not that one. Don't hit that one. Do I have it again? I think that's the right color. Is it power? What's the lamp one? Oh, my, boom. Okay, think this will work better, maybe? Yeah, <laughs> typical. Anyways, this is what a table starts off looking like. Oh, why that's so poor? That's worse. <laughs> a little bit better. Yeah, so, 
Uh, this one I made out of uh, walnut. So there it is starting to take shape. I'm not going to show you all the pictures because it gets kind of lame. Um, but originally I was trying to make it, so th these are the, the two tabletops laid out. So I try to match grain and whatnot, make it look pretty. Originally I was trying to make them without breadboard ends, um, just for an aesthetic appeal. But that did not work out. I'll show you. So here they are glued up. But anyways, I, I took like a month long hiatus from this project and the humidity changed a lot between now and then and the board started to cup on me a little bit. So I had about an eighth inch of cup on them before I actually got back to the dumb thing. So, oh yeah. So here's the breadboard ends I ended up making for it. Now you make breadboard ends so that it will hold a panel flat. And so here I am cutting the first parts of the joinery for the breadboard ends. And I had to put these big weights on it as I ran it through the table saw to bend that flex back out of it. If I had just cut these at the time that I made the panels in the first place, it would have been super simple, but I just enjoy complicating my life. So you can see the breadboard ends starting to take place. So you basically, you, you skinny them down to about a third the thickness uh, and you have a, a matching profile, which is hand cut into these breadboard ends. Um, the breadboard to ends is this part right here. So you set it up and you cut those profiles into it. So the idea behind this is you have this smaller area here that's called the haunch that keeps everything in alignment. The pin in the center is the only one that gets glued. The ones on the outside are there just to add some more strength uh, and they're completely floating. So as the board expands and contracts with changing humidity and temperature, uh, it'll hold it all together. So you can see how they slide on. Uh, th those are kind of cool actually. So you, you have to hand cut uh, squared off holes that are like over two inches thick or two inches deep all by hand. It just, it takes a little while. You know, it's like a quite physically demanding project. So here they are actually together. Flip around this way. And so you can see those breadboard ends. Now these are just, just dry fit in this picture. Um, I ended up actually draw boring them to bring them together. The legs I had to glue up for, so here they are roughed out. Whenever I do legs, I always make myself a template so I can make them all look the same. So on these, I, I got them roughed out just this far and then cut all of my joinery into them. So these were all haunched mortise and tenons. I don't think you can see it in those. Uh, this is the skirt. So this is what the table actually sits on. So you can see the haunch mortise and tenons or the haunch tenons. So again, that little nub thing on the side is just to add some torsional stiffness to the skirt. Uh, and then the, the big ear on it, that's the tenon, that, that's what actually gets glued in. So here it is just roughed out. So it's just dry fit just to make certain everything goes together. Uh, after this, I went back and profiled the legs. Actually, here, here the whole thing is. So th this is kind of what I like about this style of joinery. The whole table is put together here, just dry fit with no glue, no clamps. And it, you know, it could go like that for years if you wanted. Um, of course, you have to disassemble the thing to do the rest of the joinery. So what I'm showing here is what's called a draw bore. So this is kind of cool. You start by drilling uh, your you know, clearance for your dowels through just your breadboard end. Then you go back and reattach it. So you can see here, there's no hole drilled through those, those tenons right now. Uh, then you mark them and then you go back. And if you can see that, this right here is the center of the hole and that's where I'm actually going to drill it. So it's a little bit off center. So what you get is when you drive the, the dowel through, it actually tightens that joint back up. So it'll never come loose on you in the future. So there they are drilled. This is showing how I actually glue it up. So you only glue just that little four inches in the middle because the rest has to be free floating. Otherwise it'll break itself. Uh, and if you look in here, you can see how those holes are slightly mismatched. Now you can't just grab a dowel off the shelf and drive them through. If you do that, the dowel will snap and it could go through your hands. You have to make the dowels yourself. Uh, the dowels you make for this are riven. So they're, they're terrible looking dowels. If you look at that, it's 
it's not straight or anything, but the important part is it follows the grain. So you actually split them out and you drive them through what's called a dowel plate, which is a hardened steel plate uh, that basically cuts the thing around, but in no particular straightness. Uh, and these will bend around corners just fine. So, so that's kind of cool. Here's the legs all ready to go together. Um, I'll show you this one just so you can see the profile that's on the legs. That's an inch and a half radius. Uh, I cut that with uh, the world's largest router bit, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, what I'm doing here is actually attaching the, or at least marking out for the sliding dovetails, which is the, the hardware that the table will actually slide on. Uh, to get my clearance, I just placed a piece of paper between the two uh, and then attach them. Then you pull the paper back out and it gives you the couple thousandths of an inch that you're looking for. Uh, and then there's the table all together. So to actually use it, you can slide it to one side and then fold the table open and now you have it double sized. So if you, were, if you were in the shop in the last couple days, you saw a table shaped object and that was this one, but it's at my house now getting finished. So should be able to deliver it next week. And that's my table. I'm sorry, what? What's the finish? Oh, I'm using Osmo. It's a, it's a hard wax mixed with a urethane. So it's actually a floor finish. So, you know, you can drop stuff on it, bang stuff against it. It should last a long time. Yeah. Food grade or not? Uh, all polymers are food grade once they're dry. So, yeah, I don't think, it, I don't think they label it as food grade, but it's, once, it's, once it's done, it's totally fine. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, y'all. Don't forget your CAD drawing. Yeah. <laughs> it's really beautiful work. It's impressive to see how much know-how goes into something like that for somebody who knows nothing about it, such as myself. Uh, did anyone else bring a, something to share this evening? Amos, you got something? So this is, uh, hopefully it'll work. This is a long going show and share in that it started out in 2017. Let's see if we can get it to So do I need to drag things over to it, or is it mirror? Display settings. Match. Ah, here we are. And we go to main display. There we go. Okay, so it started out 2017. I've been forging since 2010 um, in one capacity or another. It started off with just a class at Pellissippi. Um, and then 2013, I did forging at Philmont Scott Ranch in New Mexico as a camp counselor. Um, and yeah, uh, it was a lot of fun. And then we had in, finished the blacksmithing building here in 20. 20. Uh, and prior to that, I was doing a little bit of forging every now and then at home just with a coal forge. Problem with the coal forge is you have to build a fire to even light your coal in the first place. You can't just light it directly. And the nearest place you can get coal that I know of that's good quality and doesn't have like oil and stuff mixed in with it is up in Harrogate. So you got to drive up to the border to, to get it. So that's pretty inconvenient. Um, you lose more in gas money than you do 
paying for the coal. They usually give it to you for free in the amounts I want. So, uh, so I said, okay, I'm going to build a propane forge in 2017. So I took uh, Greg Toon's welding MIG class at the time. And the, my first project right after that was, all right, we're going to build forge. I uh, went to Noble Metals in Oak Ridge and found this old air tank shown here uh, and said, that looks about like a forge. I'll take it. And they charge you by the pound um, and I, something really, really cheap. Just say, oh, yep, magnet sticks to it. It's steel. You pay this much per pound. Snare tank, so it's hollow, so it doesn't weigh too much. Very cheap. Uh, cleaned it up with angle grinder and wire brush. Uh, cut out with the uh, plasma torch, cut out the door on one side, decided I didn't like that and took a jigsaw and did it on the other one. Uh, put legs on it. And then I lost interest and I let it sit there for three years. Um, but then uh, after about a year of running the forge that uh, Andrew had put in the space, um, our, our blacksmith things are, had put his forge in there it was showing some significant signs of wear and did not look long for this world. So we decided, uh, and, it, and one of the things that I really didn't like is when it was running, it was making these burping, bad plumbing noises. Um, and so I'm like, we got to do something about this. So at that point, it was either we buy a forge and zoom, or we, or we build another one and put it in its place. And so I said, well, I've got mine that's partly done. I'll continue that. So uh, Zach had his own forge um, and we took uh, some caliper measurements of his very nice expensive commercial burner and said, let's see if we can reverse engineer it and build it. So I built this CAD model um, and you can see it's just a fusion model here. Um, and I built it uh, and this is it kind of coming apart so you can kind of see all the, the pieces of it. The reason I wanted to build a CAD model is when you're in a machine shop, it's very useful to have good quality uh, paper drawings, printouts with all the dimensions that can get, you can get oil on it. You know, you don't want to be going to a computer and looking up a measurement. And you, it's if you just make all of your paper measurements, um, make all your measurements on a piece of paper and you just do all the math in your head, it's easy as long as the number of measurements isn't too large. But when you get too many parts, it's very easy to make a math error, which is where CAD comes in. Um, so, uh, let's see, so I built that, um, put all the measurements in there and it, you can kind of see how it all goes together. Um, so if I turn on an analysis, so it's kind of split in half, uh, what it is, is the, the propane comes in and we use a MIG welding contact tip that creates the jet. The reason you use that is because it's very hard to drill a little tiny hole and those are quite, uh, very tiny. I think that was like 40 thou. Um, is what that's for, how big that hole is. And this can be positioned wherever you want in the throat um, because it's held in with this collet nut. It squeezes the uh, brass uh, eighth inch pipe nipple. And then you can adjust the amount of airflow that comes in through the slots with this choke. And so that's basically how it works. And then the choke is held in place with the thumb, thumb screw. Now, what happens is it, this is a Venturi burner. So it's air fed just passively um, and the air comes in, it accelerates as it goes through this uh, throat, and then it goes, up, the, the jet speed will go, when it gets constricted in like that, is above the flame speed in the propane. So burning can't happen. So then it, when it hits this little lip over here and then goes through a 1 12th expansion, um, which is actually a bit longer, that's the ideal expansion rate, then the flame speeds, or the jet speed slows down below the flame speed, so all of your burning happens right there and you wanna change it to stainless steel because if you do mild steel, it will melt and fail. Um, so you use stainless steel because of the higher temperature resistance. So that was the plan. Um, how do I get rid of that? I tried that. Quit system preferences. Okay, well, I don't care. Um, anyway, so I picked up where I left off. I didn't have burner mounts, uh, and with Billy's help, we made these, uh, took a piece of pipe, bored it out in the center, added six uh, set screws on it, so that's them 120 degrees apart, uh, and stuck it in, to the side of the, the uh, forge as I left it, and you can see it rusted a little bit in the Tennessee air, 
um, just sitting there because I had it perfectly clean right when I left off in 2017. Uh, drilled, uh, you know, marked out some circles, took a hole saw to it, um, and said, yep, that looks about right. In my head, I was thinking, all right, I'll have it come in, you know, kind of tangential on the exit of the insulation and have the flame just kind of spiral around. Um, and so that's what I tried to do. And so I cut it, cut the pipes like that, um, welded them on, and it looked like that once it's welded on, just MIG welded on, uh, cleaned it up a bit. Uh, let's see here. So then I bought the metal for the rest of the pieces. Um, and the very first thing I did uh, was said, all right, I'm gonna see if I can just like part this off. So I parted it off and broke the bit immediately. Um, so then we uh, filed a noops ticket, which is what you do when you break a tool. There's where it got stuck. So what happened, uh, I believe in this case, is that the tool height was just ever so slightly off. Um, and then if it's, if it's even so slightly off on, when you're doing a parting operation, the thing will roll up onto the tool, put a bunch of downward force, and then it will snap it immediately. Um, so it's really important on that operation to, uh, to, to double check that your tool height is just perfect. Um, so anyway, uh, di uh, went back to it, um, and we were making the transition part. Um, from this stock here, and we're also making the end cap. Um, so we part off just, you know, a, a puck, and we also part off another piece, and this is the transition piece, um, and that becomes that bit right there. Um, and so these are all the drawings that I had just magnetically stuck up there. Um, and you, what you do is you just kind of dog bound out a center section there. Uh, you can drill out in the center. I think that's trying to do a video. Yeah, so then you just gradually using the compound remove more and more material and then you switch to a boring bar and do it on the other side and then you have this nice little transition piece like that. And I added these uh, chamfer elements here so that way you kind of have a V groove for the weld bead to sit in so you get good weld penetration and then this uh, face allows it to all mate up nicely. Um, and so that's that and I think there's just a Yep, so there's a part off operation that didn't go poorly. I think all my pictures are gone. Wonderful. Try that one. Or. See if I can reload it. There we go. Okay. So, uh, parted off, um, so you got all the pieces like this, and then uh, did it, while, it's, while various pieces are on the lathe, you can do uh, test fit ups, um, and it will, maybe it'll do better that way. Anyway, do test fit ups, and then when you're marking pieces, uh, one of them was exactly three inches tall, so I just used a one, two, three block, some bluing, and then kind of rotate the piece around, and then that makes a nice, little hairline that you can then cut to later. Um, and then I did some, uh, some test welding pieces with these guys here just to make sure I had my act together on that. Um, and so that's what it looked like welding up. And then the plan was to clean it up. So took it, so I think this is shortly after welding, but of course I don't have internet to really load anything. So, oh, there you go little gift form. Still smoking. Uh, anyway, so you get that, and then I put it back on the lathe, and it's like, well, how good did I do? And uh, when I put it back on the lathe, there's a little bit of run out, but it doesn't matter. You turn it down um, and clean it up. And so all cleaned up. Uh, there's kind of before and after on that. Um, and then I finished the second one. And then to do the slots, I said, okay, well, we gotta have a way of indexing it. So I 3D printed this little collet block um, here. And the way that works is you've got a collet that goes around it and it screws together and then it gives you some sides. And that doesn't take any cutting forces, but it allows you to index to different angles. Um, and then I uh, uh, didn't use it pr correctly and I ended up with three, whole, three slots instead of four like I had planned. But I did it in such a way, because I, I went, was off on one of the faces, but I did it in such a way that on the third slot, it looks like it's halfway in between the other two, and you can't really tell if you just look at it, so. Recovery. 
Um, and it still worked. Uh, so there was the first uh, burner test that we did, um, just in the vise there. And then the rest was just kind of some, the finishing touches on like, all right, well, we got to figure out the details of how do we get a door on this thing. Um, and did that and put a handle on there, took some sheet metal, punched some holes in it, welded it on. And then you end up with something like this for the door that just pulls straight out. And then you can let it swing low or or prop it up a little bit and put in work that doesn't need the fully open so you reflect more heat back in. And then it's, it can pull out so that way the insulation can clear before it swings out of the way. Um, or you can just swing it completely out of the way and open it fully up. The insulation is held on, uh, which is uh, ceramic fiber insulation. Um, that's the only thing that really takes up the temperature well. Um, and we take stainless steel welding wire um, and it goes through these little buttons um, and those buttons, so it's mechanically holding it on there. Um, and the buttons deflect away most of the heat and then the stainless on the other side of it, it's low enough that the stainless can take it. That's how it works. Um, so we put those on there uh, and this is, once I finished that, I went back and did the second burner completely. This is the upstream plumbing, um, which actually was its own project. And then that was the first burner test that we did with both of them in there. Um, and there were some optimizations we needed to do to the insulation a bit. Um, and that's it, cooling down. Um, and there's the buttons once I took them out because I had to change the insulation a bit. And you can see the colors. Uh, so those are actually directly correspond to the temperatures it saw, but I don't really want to do a reverse lookup on it. Um, and that's how I put the buttons through. I just stick another piece through, scotch tape around it, and then pull it back and then take it off and bend it. So pretty simple. Um, and so there it is after I added the changes to the insulation and ITC 100 coating, which is a ceramic coating that reflects a lot more of the infrared back, saves some fuel. And you end up with, if I go back, the forge as it exists today. So now there's our new forge. Um, and afterwards, if anyone wants to see it, we can go out there and just turn it on. Um, really impressive project Amos and certainly a great asset for the organization sure appreciate you putting all that effort into it for us uh, anyone else brought anything to show us this evening have a, a few events I'd like to remind you about coming up uh, on uh, Thursday February the 10th we have a machining 101 class we've still got some slots available there uh, this is the authorization class to get involved in machining and Billy's zone there uh, so that is an opportunity that you may want to take him up on. Uh, and then on Friday, February the 11th, we've got Woodworking 101. That's the authorization class to use our gorgeous wood shop. We have positions available there as well. You can still sign up for that. Uh, and then on the 12th, which is Saturday, we've got four classes going on. There's a 101 class for the laser, the laser auth class. That one is sold out already. You've got to get that one fast. Uh, we've also got uh, Cutting Torch 101. There are spots available for that. And then you've already missed out on the TIG welding and uh, milling 101 classes on Saturday. Sorry about that. So we've got a lot of classes happening right now. I'd like to extend my thanks to everybody who's organizing these classes and putting them together for us. Those are a tremendous value to the organization and we derive a lot of benefit from that. So thank you for your efforts on that. Uh, of course, you can always see what's happening. You can go to knoxmakers.org slash events. That is our authoritative events calendar, and that is where you would go to buy tickets for events such as these. Uh, finally, let me remind you, as alluded to by Bob earlier, that we are asking everybody to convert their storage over to be fully enclosed in bins, please. Uh, we have been quite permissive in the past in allowing uh, a wide variety of uh, totally bizarre, creative, and abusive uses of our storage system. Uh, and as we're trying to work through reorganizing the workshop right now, we find that that's not worked out super good. Uh, so please, in the very near future, work to convert your member storage into a bin. We do have bins available that we're happy to vend to you if you don't want to be bothered to go and get one. We have the sort of standard issue bin. If you are a light duty kind of person, those are 15 bucks. 
And then we've got the heavier duty bin. If you're liable to put large, pokey, heavy things and smash it around some, you might want one of those. Those are 30 bucks. You can also source your own bin, of course, as long as it's substantially the same size. Or you can make your own, as Bob has done, which is also super awesome and a good way to show your personality. Any and all of those are super acceptable. Uh, and you can pay for them uh, just using the donate mechanism on our website if you'd like, or we'll work something else out. Uh, please do be sure to put your name, which is to say your entire name, not merely your first name, on the bin as well as the slot that you're occupying so that we can make certain that we know what belongs to who as things get moved around a little bit as we reorganize. So uh, that is the completion of our program this evening. Thank you all for your attendance, your time, and your attention. Let's go out in the workshop and make some weird stuff and hang out together. <laughs>